Hello, everyone. I'm I'm Judge Brewer. Um, we're on the record for case number 2022 CA1128, Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt versus Christopher Laundry and Roberta Laundry. And we are noticed for today on plaintiff's motion for, uh, for leave to file a second amended complaint that appears on the docket at number 60. And would counsel please introduce themselves. Good morning, Your Honor. Patrick Riley for uh, Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt. Hi, Mr. Riley. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Matt Luca on behalf of the defendants, Christopher and Roberta Laundry. It's Luca. Luca, L-U-K-A. Yes, okay, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much. Nice to meet you both. Nice to meet you. All right, um, and Mr. Riley, your clients filed the motion, so I'm going to let you get us started off. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I'll actually be brief because I think I'll then defer to counsel and I'd like to respond to, to what he argues. I mean, as the court knows, uh, Florida allows very liberal amendments to pleadings, um, and uh, the, the, the cases say uh, the court should err in favor of allowing the pleading. We're, I'll address all my responses to Mr. Luca, um, if it's all right with your court, uh, with your honor, after he makes his argument. But I think the cause of action, we're simply moving to add another party. Okay. Sir, if you'd like to respond. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, and we certainly don't agree, uh, disagree with Mr. Riley that Florida does have a liberal uh, amendment policy. Um, that, that, that is, that's certainly the case. However, um, that policy is not absolute and that the plaintiffs are always entitled to amend. In this case, they want to add the defendant's attorney, Stephen Bertolino. He's an attorney in New York, and he represented them uh, throughout the investigation that preceded this litigation. Um, Your Honor, there's, there's, three, there's three factors that the court can consider in determining whether to allow a plaintiff to amend. Uh, one is whether the privilege to amend has been abused. Uh, the second is whether the amendment is futile. And the third is whether there's prejudice to the defendants. Uh, with regard to whether the privilege has been abused, now we're, we're certainly not asserting that um, the plaintiffs have filed too many complaints or they've unreasonably amended in the past. Our position is that they unreasonably delayed in filing this request to amend. Uh, the deadline to file amendments um, and to add parties was August 26, 2022. Uh, the plaintiffs waited about three months to file the instant motion for leave to amend. Uh, and the plaintiffs have had everything that they needed to amend since the inception of this case. Um, essentially, the, the crux of this case is based upon a statement by attorney Stephen Bertolino uh, that appeared in the original complaint. Uh, and that statement was a focus of the party's arguments at the hearing on the motion to dismiss, which was several months ago. Um, nothing has changed. Uh, and in fact, at the, uh, at the hearing on the motion to dismiss, plaintiff's counsel commented that the only reason that Mr. Bertolino is not a defendant is because he lives in New York. Uh, and that, that fact certainly hasn't changed either. Um, so this really isn't a situation where new facts have come to light during discovery or that Mr. Bertolino was unknown or his statement was unknown. The plaintiffs had everything they needed to amend prior to the deadline for amendments. Now, now the defendants recognize that this case hasn't reached the summary judgment stage or the trial stage at, at this point and that discover, discovery is still ongoing. So it's not as though there's some insurmountable time crunch that the parties have to deal with. Uh, none the, nonetheless, um, the defendant should be able to rely upon the deadlines that the court set, uh, particularly for something as important as adding a defendant who, who is also their attorney. Now, Your Honor, turning to the, uh, the factor um, as to whether or not the amendment would be futile, um, the plaintiffs here have alleged an intentional tort. Um, and, that, and that's important because the plaintiffs have alleged that Mr. Bertolino's liability rests on the fact that he was acting as the agent for the laundries, as their attorney. Um, but they have also alleged that each of the three defendants, including Mr. Bertolino, acted willfully and maliciously in making the statement. Now, that's not surprising because a cause of action for intentional infliction of de emotional distress does require uh, a deliberate act, de deliberately inflicting emotional distress. And, and in fact, uh, it's not even enough that a defendant acted with an intent which is tortious or even criminal. 
um, or that a defendant intended to inflict emotional distress, or even that the defendant's conduct can be characterized by malice or a degree of aggravation which would entitle the plaintiff to punitive damages for another tort. Rather, liability is established only where the alleged conduct is so outrageous in character and so extreme in degree as to go beyond all possible down, bounds of decency and to be regarded as atrocious and utterly intolerable tolerable in a civilized community. Now, the plaintiff's amendment claims that the laundries individually and Mr. Bertolino individually acted with this high, heightened mental state. If, as the amended complainant alleges, Mr. Bertolino was simply acting as the agent of the laundries and doing what they instructed him to do, then he certainly wouldn't have this mental state. That seemed to be the position that the plaintiffs took at the motion to dismiss. Uh, on the flip side, if Ms. Mr. Bertolino did have this heightened mental state and the laundries were relying upon his advice as their attorney in issuing this statement, then they could not have had this heightened mental state. Mr. Bertolino would have stepped outside his role as an attorney so the, the, so the laundries couldn't be liable in, in that circumstance. At the hearing on the motion to dismiss, the court found that Mr. Ber Bertolino's knowledge and intent were essentially irrelevant because he was acting as their agent when he made the statement. If Mr. Bertolino is a defendant and he's alleged to have acted with that heightened mental state, then that changes the equation quite a bit with regard to the liability of all the parties. Um, of course, we don't agree with, with the plaintiffs that Mr. Bertolino's statement was outrageous. And our position is that neither the laundries nor Mr. Bertolino had the intent to inflict emotional distress. But even if we assume for the sake of argument um, that the statement was outrageous, it's implausible that all three of the defendants would have had that heightened mental state given their respective roles with regard to issuing that state. Uh, this is not a case where there's alleged to be a conspiracy or some collusion in some way for them to issue this statement uh, with an intent um, to inflict emotional distress. Your Honor, also with regard to the futility argument, we've um, raised the, the Florida's litigation privilege now, now, the litigation privilege affords absolute immunity to statements that are made during a judicial proceeding. Um, in in Fritovich versus Fritovich, the Florida Supreme Court recognized a qualified immunity for statements made to police in a pre-indictment context. So the Florida Supreme Court has extended the litigation privilege outside of the litigation context to include other statements if, if they're sufficiently connected. Um, there are a couple other cases that we cited in our brief. Ainge, uh, which was with regard to statements made to a judge uh, during a, a, the search warrant context and, and obtaining a search warrant. Robertson, uh, which were statements made to uh, the insurance commissioner. And Delmonico, which were statements made in, during an informal investigation uh, while litigation was pending. Um, it, it's, our, it's our position that Mr. Bertolino's statement was made in response to requests from law enforcement for comment. Um, so so we would, we, our position is that the litigation privilege would cover it, even, even a qualified privilege. Uh, I'd also like to point out that ABA Model Rule of Professional Responsibility 3.6 subsection C provides that a lawyer may make a statement that a reasonable lawyer would believe is required to protect a client from the, from the substantial undue prejudicial effect of recent publicity not initiated by the lawyer or the lawyer's client. Um, keep in mind that at the time of this statement, uh, Mr. Bertolino was also representing Brian Laundrie, um, who was unquestionably under investigation for murder, um, and that there was an incredible amount of media attention. So, so we would assert that if Mr. Bertolino is permitted by the rules of professional conduct to make such a statement, then the litigation privilege should extend should extend to such a, such a statement and, and shield it from, from litigation. Uh, lastly, Your Honor, with regard to the prejudice to the laundries, um, Mr. Bertolino has been their attorney since the inception of this investigation. He's still their attorney. Um, and he owes them all the, the duties that an attorney would normally owe to a client, uh, including communication, confidentiality, lawyer, uh, loyalty, and such. Uh, and if he's a co-defendant, he can't fulfill those duties. This is not a, a more typical situation as the plaintiffs asserted in their, in their brief where an attorney and a client um, are sued together because they're alleged to have conspired in some way 
um, to commit a crime or some other act. And in fact, you know, their, their communications in such a context um, wouldn't even be protected because the crime fraud exception to the attorney-client privilege would, um, would, would effectively do away with any protection. Th this is a novel situation where an attorney's rather benign statement is alleged to have been made with the intent to harm the family of the victim of a crime that was not committed by these defendants. Um, so it is a very, very unique and novel situation that the plaintiffs are try trying to bring here. It also can't be um, ignored that Mr. Bertolino's representation of Brian Laundry um, put him in a position to, to have far superior knowledge of the facts and circumstances of what occurred um, than, the, than the defendants in this case, the laundry parents. Um, that, that, that certainly it doesn't, uh, it can't go unnoticed. You know, es essentially adding Mr. Bertolino here as, 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 as a defendant puts the attorney-client privilege and Mr. Bertolino's other, uh, other duties to the defendants squarely at issue not just his duties to the laundry parents who are the defendants in this case, but also his duties to Brian Laundry. Um, even though Brian Laundry is deceased, the attorney-client privilege res with respect to his statement survives. Um, now, Your Honor, Mr. if Mr. Bertolino were added as, as a defendant here, both he and the Laundries would have an interest in defending themselves. And that defense could potentially be to the detriment of each other. Um, depending on what positions they were to take in the litigation. And uh, plaintiffs effectively want to invade the attorney-client privilege by putting Mr. Bertolino in an untenable position where he would want to defend himself and potentially use attorney-client privilege information, but he can't. And on the flip side, my clients may not want to use that attorney-client privilege, but they're in a put, put in a position where they would have to waive that, that attorney-client privilege just so Mr. Bertolino could, could defend himself, just so he could present a defense. Otherwise, they'd be in a situation where essentially they would have a, a co-defendant sitting at the table who couldn't speak, who couldn't defend himself. Uh, it, it, would be, it would be an incredible, awkward, and odd trial if that were the case. Uh, the the, the attorney-client privilege is a foundational principle in our legal system. Enforcing a conflict over that privilege by adding Mr. Bertolino as a defendant would violate the public policy behind that privilege. As stated before, plaintiffs allege Mr. Bertolino is only liable because he was acting as the agent of the laundries, that acting as their attorney. If he didn't personally have the intent to intentionally do harm, then he shouldn't be a defendant. The laundry should be able to defend this case without worrying whether their attorney is going to take a position that is antagonistic to them or, or, or that somehow they, they wouldn't have the full, um, they, they wouldn't be able to avail themselves of all the duties that Mr. Bertolino owes them because of his situation as a co-defendant. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Um, Mr. Riley. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. I kind of felt like I was listening to an argument on a motion to dismiss, um, not on a motion as to whether or not a complaint should be amended. And it, and it sounded more to me like Mr. Luca was representing Mr. Bertolino than he is representing the laundries. I think none of that has any relevance to, to what's before the court today. Again, as I said, it's the public policy of the courts in Florida to freely allow amendments, except in three instances, as counsel pointed out. And I'll address whether or not the privilege has first been abused. Counsel didn't argue that the privilege has been abused. He simply said we're beyond the date where the um, deadline was set to uh, file an amendment to the complaint or to amend the pleadings. It's important to note that the pleadings in this case weren't actually closed until I believe it was July 15th of 2022 when the answer to the complaint was filed and the deadline to file an amended complaint was I believe in August. So, the pleadings were just barely closed at the time that deadline came up. And maybe we should have filed uh, earlier to join him, but I don't think the fact that, that a deadline to file a pleading, to uh, uh, an amendment to the pleading came and passed is abuse uh, when you're considering whether or not to allow the amended complaint to be filed. Um, we could file a complaint against Mr. Bertolino separately 
uh, and then asked to have the, the, um, the matters joined for purposes of trial uh, and for discovery. So I, I don't see how that there has been an abuse uh, by the failure at this point in time, or up until now, to request that he be joined. There's been no depositions. There's been minimal uh, uh, paper discovery that has been exchanged. Uh, large a, a part of the problem in this case is there was a, a FOIA request filed with the federal government back in the summer of 22, I believe it was, or maybe even earlier. And we've been waiting for that information and we still don't have it. So discovery really can't move forward in terms of depositions until uh, we have that information. So there's really no delay being caused by the filing of this motion. Secondly, addressing the issue uh, of whether or not the amendment would be futile, the, the courts have held that proposed amendments are futile when they are not pled with sufficient particularity or are insufficient as a matter of law. And I cited the court to the case of Thompson versus Bank of New York, which affirmed the trial court's denial of a motion to, uh, to amend because the allegations of fraud were conclusory and lacking in any real allegations of ultimate fact showing fraud such that the proposed amendment pleading, the amended pleading was insufficient as a matter of law. Council hasn't suggested in this instance um, that the amended complaint hasn't been pled with sufficient particularity or is insufficient as a matter of law. Florida courts have held a futility of an amendment when it conclusively appears there's no possible way to amend it to state a cause of action. What I think is critical is futility uh, should be analyzed based upon the face of the proposed amendments, uh, the proposed amendment amended pleadings. And that's the case of JBJ Investments of South Florida versus, uh, Inc. versus Southern Title Group, 251 Southern 3rd, 173. Additionally, any doubt with respect to futility should be resolved in favor of allowing the amendment, especially when leave to amend is sought at or before the summary judgment stage. And that's the case of RV-7 Property, Inc. versus Defani Delay O, Inc., 187 Southern 3rd, 915. As I said uh, just a minute ago, the de defendants don't suggest that the amended complaint is insufficient as a matter of law because the Second Amendment contains any conclusory allegations or lacks any real allegations of ultimate fact supporting the cause of action. In fact, Judge Carroll has already found that based on these exact same pleadings, uh, the motion to dismiss was defeated, that the case was sufficient uh, to move forward on these very facts. So we're not addressing these facts again because the, the court's already ruled that it's sufficient. What we're addressing is whether or not a new party should be added based on those facts. Interestingly, the defendants uh, instead focus upon alleged defenses that perhaps Attorney Bertolino could raise. I would submit that's not sufficient uh, to show that this complaint is insufficient as a matter of law. But even if, if, if it is appropriate to address those issues at this point in time, which I don't believe it is because they are defenses to be raised, not something to uh, show that the amendment would be futile, the defendants first suggest that if, and it's their words, if Stephen Bertolino committed an intentional tort for his own purposes and not on behalf of his clients, then his clients cannot be liable for the act of their agent and the laundry should be dismissed. But the dismissal of the laundries is not, again, an issue in this case. This is not a motion to dismiss. As counsel indicated, generally an attorney is an agent for his client and the acts of the, of the agent are the acts of the principal. In a principal agent situation, the principal is liable, in this case the laundries, if the wrongful act is done while the agent, Mr. Bertolino, is acting within the scope of his apparent authority, even though the act was not authorized by or was forbidden by the employer or was not necessary or appropriate to serve the interest of the employer, unless the act was done to accomplish his own purposes as distinct from the employer's business. Again, we have to look at the face of the complaint. What does the face of the complaint say about what Mr. Bertolino was doing at the time he made the statement? Paragraph 8 says that at all times relevant to the cause of action, Stephen Bertolino was acting as the agent for Christopher Laundry and Roberta Laundry. Paragraph 28 sta sa states that Stephen Bertolino was acting on behalf of Christopher Laundry and L Roberta Laundry when he issued the statement which is the substance of the claim for intentional infliction of emotional distress. We haven't 
alleged that he was acting outside of the scope of his authority when he made the statement. The statement clearly, the complaint clearly states he was acting on behalf of the laundries at the time he made the statement. So the principals are liable, uh, the, uh, the laundries are liable in this instance, as is the agent. Because an agent is individually liable to a third person for the agent's tortious uh, conduct. And I cited the court to Sussman versus First Financial Title Company of Florida at 793 Southern 2nd, 1066. I'd also like to cite the court to the third restatement of agency, section 701, which says, an agent is subject to liability to a third party harmed by the agent's tortious conduct. Unless an applicable statute provides otherwise, an actor remains subject to liability although the actor acts as an agent or an employee with actual or apparent authority or within the scope of employment. To suggest that the claim can only be made against the laundries or on one hand or against Mr. Bertolino on the other hand is simply incorrect. It's entirely appropriate and it's entire, entirely uh, uh, proper to set forth a claim against both of them under circumstances such as this. The defendants then suggest, again, really a, a, an issue for a defense, not an, ar an argument on whether or not we should be permitted to amend. They suggest that Mr. Bertolino is afforded immunity under the litigation privilege. While this may be posed by Mr. Bertolino as a defense, it's certainly not the subject of whether or not it's appropriate to file uh, a motion or to, to grant a motion to amend. I would also um, cite the court to a case, and I apologize for not providing this previously. But this is the case of the University of South Florida Board of Trustees versus Moore. It's a September 30, 2022 case at 347 Southern 3rd, 545. In that instance, the issue was whether or not um, uh, there was immunity, sovereign immunity provided to agencies of the state. The same argument would apply here where the court ruled, when ruling on a motion to dismiss, and I understand this isn't a motion to dismiss, but I, I, there's an analogy. When ruling on a motion to dismiss based on sovereign immunity, courts are required to treat as true the complainant's allegations including those that incorporate attachments and to look no further than the amended complaint and its attachments. A motion to dismiss is not a substitute for a motion for a summary judgment. And in ruling on a motion to dismiss a complaint, the trial court is confined to consideration of the allegations found within the four corners of the complaint. Counsel has suggested that Mr. Bertolino has a defense to this case and therefore we should not allow the amendment to take place because it would be futile. But even if the court allows this to go forward, Mr. Bertolino cannot allege uh, uh, in a motion to dismiss that he has immunity because the court says you just look at the four corners of the complaint. So to suggest that he has these defenses doesn't mean that filing the amended complaint at this point would be futile. It simply means that at some point after the pleadings are closed, he may have an opportunity to address those uh, defenses if they are applicable. Defendant also suggests um, that count that, that's the statements made in the course of a, ju a judicial proceeding. I'm going to address that issue even though I don't believe it's appropriate to be raised at this point. But correctly suggests that statements made in the course of judicial proceedings are absolutely privileged no matter how false or malicious the statements may be so long as the statements are relevant to the subject of the inquiry. There's two problems with their argument. Um, first, as they stated in their motion, we cannot know for certain what proceedings such as grand jury proceedings, search warrant applications, or other judicially supervised investigative proceedings had been underway at the time Mr. Bertolini made the statement because those investigative proceedings are done ex parte and are not disclosed publicly. Well, if the defendant can't tell us what they are, how can the court say, well, there was a, a proceeding pending uh, and therefore uh, uh, Mr. Bertolino's st statements would be protected. Secondly, without knowing what those proceedings are, how could the court determine if the statements were relevant to the subject of the proceeding? So I think that argument, although it shouldn't be made here, fails, uh, and, and I don't think that the, that the defendants have presented anything to show that allowing the amendment in this case would be futile. The third issue which is addressed, again, is one that's really interesting about the prejudice to 
uh, Mr. Bertolino, a lot of the argument was about Mr. Bertolino, and to the laundries in this particular case. Uh, the court has said in Morgan versus Bank of New York Mellon, 200 Southern 2nd, 792, a Florida 1st DCA 2016 case, whether granting the proposed amendment would prejudice, prejudice the opposing party is analyzed primarily in the context of the opposing party's ability to prepare for the new allegations or defenses prior to trial. The defendants themselves in their uh, opposition to this motion have stated, the, propo the proposed amendment adds some additional jurisdictional allegations related to Mr. Bertolino but by and large, the proposed amendment does not change the cause of action or the foundational factual allegations supporting that cause of action. And in fact, there are no new allegations addressed to the defendants in this case. It's simply adding another defendant to the case. So the, def the defendants have not cited this court to any case to support their position with regard to how difficult it would, will be for the defendants to defend themselves whether the attorney-client privilege will be violated, and all of those other issues raised by them, they've not provided one case to support their argument that that's grounds not to allow the, the filing of an amended complaint. I would go back to the case that I just cited, Morgan, where the, the, there is no prejudice to the defendant um, because of their ability to prepare for new allegations or defenses prior to trial, because there are none. So in conclusion, I would argue they failed to establish that um, uh, the right to file an amended complaint has been abused. They failed to establish that it would be futile to, uh, if the amended complaint is allowed to be filed, and they failed to establish prejudice to the parties. It doesn't matter whether there's prejudice to Mr. Bertolino at this point. He's not a party. They failed to establish this, that there's prejudice to uh, the laundries uh, in allowing the filing of the amended complaint. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have reviewed the, um, first off, I have reviewed the court file in total for this case, and as well, specifically, as, as Judge Carroll, um, as to Judge Carroll's order denying the defendant's motion to dismiss, and the instant motion, as well as defendant's response, and uh, plaintiff's reply to defendant's response, and I've heard the arguments, and at this time, I am going to be granting the motion for a leave to amend. Um, I, um, find that the plaintiffs have not abused the privilege of amendment, that the amendment um, at this juncture uh, is not futile, and um, there is no prejudice to the current um, defendants um, as to their preparation for trial or summary judgment. So I will be granting the motion for leave to amend. There was a complaint attached. Um, we can deem that to be filed as of today or as of the date of the order, whichever one you should so choose. It's up to both of you. It, it doesn't matter to me, Your Honor, whatever you decide. Yeah, is Your Honor, we have no preference either. Okay. Um, I guess it, the only difference it might make is just the, the amount of time we have to respond. Okay, let's, um, do, so. it, let's do it as of today then. And uh, how much time, uh, well, you're not representing um, Mr. Bertolino. Bertolino. I am not, and no, you're you haven't right. gotten him served, no. obviously, so. Um, with that being said, um, we'll just do standard uh, standard time uh, uh, pursuant to the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, and then uh, if any amendments need to be made to your responses, then obviously um, you'll get the appropriate amount of time to, um, when I say you, you and your clients, uh, uh, Mr. Um, Luca, you'll be able to do that. Um, anything, uh, with that being said, I, and this may be a tick premature, but I know that you guys are set for trial for August. That's yes, my understanding. That's correct. Um, does anybody believe that that's going to happen? You, you know, you know, I was actually going to talk to Mr. Uh, Riley about this. You know, maybe after this hearing, um, it, just based upon how long it's taking to get a response to this FOIA request. And, and I understand that this is important information. That's and, and, you. I, and I think right. we, yeah. we both, Mr. Riley and I, would like to see what what he gets back there. So. Um, you know, it may be a situation where we are going to need to move to extend all of the deadlines um, if, this, if it just kind of continues to drag on. It, the, the latest information we have is that we'll have it by the end of this month, yes, um, but we've heard that before. Okay. Um, so we can pause this discussion until maybe we, we kind of get together for a case management or something to kind of see where we are. Um, I, I don't want you all to be on the... August calendar 
thinking that we're going to be going and then it not happen. I'd rather us know in advance that it's not going to, um, especially adding in a new party. I'm assuming that Mr. Bertolino is going to defend the action. Um, he's, he's here with us today on, on Zoom. So um, with that being said, we'll probably want to set a case management sooner rather than later. You're expecting when, when is the expectation for the FOIA request within, again? Within the next week. I would, that's we we're told by the end of the month. Okay, so if the two of you would would contact my judicial assistant and let's maybe schedule some time for a case management um, coming up here in the next month or so, just okay. so that I have a good idea and we can kind of have it structured um, going forward and, and what we're thinking. Time can we wise. can we do an early March judge give us time to serve Mr. Bertolino and then that, that's that's absolutely fine with me. Okay, I, 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 when I said. I mean, it's it's January twenty fourth now, so yes. I, I, <laughs> within I, the next month, early March and into February is about the same thing. Isn't it? I'll assume responsibility. <laughs> so, I'll assume responsibility for getting that scheduled. Very good. And uh, would you provide me a proposed order, Mr. Riley, um, after running that by um, your opposing counsel and uh, send that through the portal? I will do that, Your Honor. All right. Anything else that we need to cover today? No. No, I don't think so. Thank you for all time, right. Your Honor. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Y'all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you too. too. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. You provided two notebooks. I don't know if the other one was supposed to go to somebody else. I don't know or, why I did that. Um, I'm going to give you back your other notebook. That's, thanks. I'm saying thanks, but now I have to carry it. <laughs> <laughs> A Florida judge grants the motion to add laundry family attorney Stephen Bertolino to the lawsuit filed by Gabby Petito's parents against Chris and Roberta Laundry. A trial, of course, scheduled for later this year in Sarasota County Court that will now have three co-defendants. Chris Laundry, Roberta Laundry, and Stephen Bertolino. Hello there to you folks, JB here with you live on WFLA Now. Don't go anywhere because we are getting our camera crews repositioned outside of the courtroom to uh, hopefully provide you with a uh, post-hearing press conference, if you will. It's really just going to be an interview outside of the courthouse in Sarasota County. I will say this, I'm going to begin this by saying that based on the legal experts that I have spoken to in advance of this hearing, uh, this was considered to be, of all the motions that have been filed up until this point, this was considered to be the one that was most likely, most likely, uh, to be denied. Uh, the motion has been granted uh, that attorney Stephen Bertolino, who was on this call virtually on Zoom, uh, attending this uh, from New York uh, on the Zoom call with his camera on, uh, he will be added as a co-defendant uh, to the lawsuit filed against Chris and Roberta Laundry. There were multiple arguments, three arguments made as to why this should be thrown out. Judge Brewer, Judge Daniel Brewer, who uh, is presiding now uh, in this case, uh, instead of Judge Hunter W. Carroll, who's been in previous pretrial hearings, uh, ruling that the, uh, that the motion um, and, and the arguments for dismissing uh, this motion uh, did not meet the standard necessary for her uh, to, to toss out uh, the motion to add Bertolino. So here we are. Stephen Bertolino will be added as a co-defendant, uh, really uh, sending this now into uh, really a, a different roadmap as far as what's going to transpire between now and August, August when it is scheduled to go to a jury trial, August of 2023. Uh, later this year. Very eager to get to your reaction. We're going to be featuring some of your hashtag HJB questions and comments. You heard they're very interesting as well about the depositions and about these, this FOIA request that uh, it, the FBI is uh, working on completing, or I believe the federal government working on completing as far as the FBI's evidence uh, being made available uh, to the parties in this case so that it can be used as far as the lawsuit going forward, uh, attorney Pat Riley has indicated to me and indicated publicly that he wants that FOIA request back before the depositions take place. The depositions, uh, massive in this one regard. It will be the first time uh, that the parents of Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry are in the same room at the same time with questions being asked. Um, it's the first time that these two 
that these two sets of parents have uh, will see each other. And that is expected to happen in the weeks or months ahead. Again, I'm going to pay attention here to this screen down here because I'm going to hit the touch screen and take you to outside the courthouse where we're expecting to hear, hopefully, from both attorneys if they stick around. I can share uh, Stephen Bertolino did not uh, stay on the Zoom call or didn't appear to stay on the Zoom call. Uh, he turned his camera off or he left uh, before the actual hearing itself wrapped up. Uh, there was a period of several minutes there uh, or maybe a couple of minutes where he was no longer on the call. So we're going to get to some of your comments, some of your questions, uh, but I'm very, you know, I'm very eager to hear from my friend Peter Tragos. Uh, I'm very he eager to hear from some of our other legal experts that we bring here on stream. Uh, I think that this is going to be a very interesting reaction across Tampa Bay, uh, across the state of Florida, uh, because of the protections that attorneys are normally provided when it comes to pro providing uh, for their clients, providing legal representation for their clients. Um, so how attorneys in particular react to this, an attorney from New York being added as a co-defendant to a lawsuit uh, and a very high profile lawsuit at that is it's just going to be a very, very fascinating ripple effect of reaction uh, across the Sunshine State. All right, as we, oh, okay, the, the feed is popping up and I believe that that is Pat Riley standing outside of the courthouse, our camera crew getting positioned, figuring out the shot. Let's listen in live. That? Yeah, that happens every couple of years. And she's going to be the judge throughout. As long as it doesn't go for two or three so years. They, oh, so they wouldn't move <laughs> no. you guys up? No. Okay. I, I, I thought they would. I wasn't. I was hoping they would. Not that I have any disrespect for her. I was hoping they would. Just, just for... Because he knew. He knew the case. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Are we up? Really? We might be. Is this like it? All right. Okay. Mr. Riley, could you please tell us your name and spell it just for the record? Yes, Patrick Riley, R E I L L Y. Tell us what happened here today. We had a hearing today uh, because, on behalf of Joseph Petito and uh, Nicole Schmidt, I asked the court for permission to amend the complaint to join attorney Stephen Bertolino as a defendant in this lawsuit because he's the one who made the statement, uh, which is basically the subject of this, of this lawsuit. And after an argument today, the court agreed that the motion uh, was granted uh, and will be permitted to file the amended complaint against Mr. Bertolino. What does this mean when it comes to sure. when this finally does go to trial? Well, it means we have uh, Mr. Bertolino sitting at the defense table with his clients uh, with regard to a statement he made on behalf of his clients. And, you know, when you talk about him being the agent in the situation and you talk about liability with all of this, can you kind of just explain your side of all of this, why you feel like he should be named? Well, an attorney speaks on behalf of a client, and oftentimes uh, the clients, the attorney speaking of the direction of the client. In this particular instance, Mr. Bertolino, Mr. Bertolino made a statement uh, in, in which we all know what the statement is at this particular point in, in time, hoping that the... Uh, that Gabby would be found and reunited with her body, and our position is that both Mr. Bertolino and the Laundries knew that she was deceased at the time that that statement was made, so that's the basis of the claim, uh, and that's the reason we brought Mr. Bertolino in as well. All right. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, your client's reaction to this decision? Oh, uh, they're happy. Um, you know, they've, they've been through a lot. Uh, they've had to listen to a lot of statements made by Mr. Bertolino on behalf of the family, uh, statements that sometimes were hurtful to them. Uh, and so they believe that by bringing Mr. Bertolino in, they ultimately will get justice for what has occurred. You know, I don't think I've seen a moment in the courtroom where I didn't see tears coming from the family. It's unusual. It's, um, it still haunts them what happened. It still hurts them deeply. Um, we were talking about Gabby and her birthday earlier today, that her birthday's coming up in March, and, um, and it's a difficult time for them. Okay. Talk about where things go from here now. Um, I know you're still waiting on some important information for discovery. Yes, we uh, submitted a, a request, a FOIA request, to the federal government asking for a variety of documents based on their investigation in this particular case. We don't have them. There's a lot of documents from what I understand, and I understand it's taking them a lot of time to put together, so I'm not at all being critical of them because it's taking so long, but it's slowed down our process here. We need those documents, both sides need those documents in, in order to complete discovery, to do depositions, and to prepare for trial. And so uh, we're hopeful we'll have them within uh, 
by the end of this particular by the end of this month, and then we can move on as soon as Mr. Bertolino is served and part of this case to move the case forward. Okay. And I guess just you know, with an attorney being named in this case, I mean, how unusual is that? I mean, have you been a part of a case like this? I haven't. No, it is very unusual. Can you speak to why that's unusual? Well, typically when an attorney is acting on behalf of a client, there are situations like this don't arise. It's just that it was it's an unusual factual situation. As as Attorney Luca argued, typically an attorney is not liable for things that are said on behalf of a client or or are said in the course of litigation. This wasn't said in the course of litigation. There was nothing pending to our knowledge. And so that's why it's a very unusual situation. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Anything else that you want to mention? I don't believe so. OK, thank you. Mr. Riley. Yes. Hi, I'm Julie with the Nerd Report. I just have two quick questions for you. OK. Pivoting off of your last question, did you come into this courtroom today with high expectations that the judge was going to rule in your favor? I did. The law was on our side. And so I fully expected that this was not going to be the rare situation where we're not allowed to amend. OK. And secondly, was there not depositions that were scheduled for today? They were. But again, because we don't have the FOIA information, I couldn't prepare appropriately for the deposition. And we don't want to take a deposition and then have to reschedule it when that information comes in. So when do you think possibly the depositions may go forward? My guess is probably sometime in March or April. And now that the judge has ruled in your favor, will Mr. Bertolino be subject to the deposition as well? If he stays in the case, and I have no doubt that he will file something to try to get the case dismissed against him. But yes, if he's in the case, his deposition will be taken. OK. Thank you very much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. See you, Matt. Have a safe trip. Yeah, you too, Matt. We are still up here just a little while there. I'll wait for the door because I don't want you to get run over. I might be coming out. All righty. Sir, could you please tell us your name and spell it? You know it, but for the record. Matt Luca. L-U-K-A. OK. So tell us kind of your arguments here today. And can you kind of just tell us kind of how it is that you were interested in the investigation? Sure. It is unusual. You know, we were asking the court to deny the plaintiff's request for leave to amend the complaint to add Mr. Bertolino as a defendant. Our argument was essentially that if the plaintiffs wanted to add Mr. Bertolino as a defendant, the deadline for that had passed. And so they should have done it earlier. We also believe that adding Mr. Bertolino as a defendant raises some legal issues with regard to the sufficiency of the complaint. And the legal term for that is futility. So we would expect that Mr. Bertolino is going to be filing a motion to dismiss the complaint. We will also need to renew our motion to dismiss the complaint just to preserve the issues that we previously presented and present any new arguments. I know, of course, you represent the law and you're mainly in this. I don't know your relationship with Mr. Bertolino. Will you be representing him? Do we know who will be representing him? I do not expect to be representing Mr. Bertolino. And at this point, I don't know who is going to be representing him, but I'm sure that he'll have somebody very soon. And one thing, if you wouldn't mind just kind of elaborating in simple terms what we discussed up there, just one of the points you made talking about, you know, when this does go to trial, how unusual it is with, you know, having an attorney sitting essentially on the same side as, you know, his clients that he was representing in the early days of this and potentially there being some conflict there. Yes, it's a very challenging situation. It does happen from time to time where an attorney and a client are either charged with a crime together or are sued together. It does happen. However, it is unusual. And the facts and circumstances of this case are particularly unusual. Now, the reason why it's going to be challenging for us is because the plaintiff's complaint essentially comes down to the statement that was made by Mr. Bertolino and the knowledge that everybody had, both Mr. Bertolino and the defendants, when that statement was made. But the attorney-client privilege protects all of that information. So Mr. Bertolino could never testify as to what he knew because everything he knew was from his clients, both Brian Laundrie and the Laundrie parents. And so Mr. Bertolino would be in a very difficult situation. And it puts my clients in a difficult situation as well because 
they, of course, have an interest in Mr. Bertolino defending himself. himself. Uh, they want to defend themselves. And so now the attorney-client privilege is put in, in the pressure cooker where they've got to make a decision as to whether or not to waive that. Um, so it does, it does put them in a precarious situation. We're hopeful that uh, the judge grants Mr. Bertolino's motion to dismiss if he does file one um, and that this won't be an issue once we get to trial. Anything I can ask you that you feel is important to mention in this, uh, where we stand? In uh, no, we're, we really appreciate the judge's time. Uh, and as, as you heard, it's likely that a lot of the uh, deadlines are going to get extended in this case because uh, we've had some difficulty in conducting the discovery. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, that happens in these cases from time to time. I, I would expect probably the next thing that occurs would be uh, Mr. Bertolino filing a motion to dismiss. Um, and in terms of the Longer family, when will we see them in court, not until trial? Uh, unlikely that we would see them until the trial. Sure, absolutely. Mr. Luca Julie with Nerd Report. How likely, how confident were you today that the judge may rule in your favor as opposed to against it? Well, of course, we always we always think that there that, that there's a chance, um, and that's why we filed an, an opposition to this. Um, although we do recognize that um, in a motion for leave to an amended complaint. Um, the standard is very liberal in Florida. Typically, plaintiffs are allowed to do it. So um, we did expect that it was going to be a difficult burden for us to overcome. Um, you, one of your arguments that you made was um, Mr. Bertolino being um, Brian's attorney as well. And you stated that even though he's deceased, the attorney-client privilege still exists. Can you elaborate on that for a bit? Sure. He, he, um, you know, the, the Supreme Court has held that um, even if a client dies, um, that the client's communications with the lawyer that pre preceded his death, um, that that privilege survives, that, uh, that that attorney cannot disclose that information. See. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it.